So in case you missed last week's video, I covered the cost of building your own kitchen cabinets versus purchasing semi-custom cabinets, as well as the process of building these cabinet boxes with the help of my CNC. And in this week's video, I'm going to cover the process of getting all of the hardware installed, including these awesome Bloom servo drive touch to open door hinges and drawer slides, which are just ridiculously cool. Before we do that though, let's rewind a bit and take a look at some of the footage from my trip to Bloom's factory, which I was lucky enough to tour over the summer. And their factory, come to find out, is a short drive from here in Asheville. And let me tell you, it was amazing to see all of this hardware come to life in person. And I honestly had no idea this stuff was made so close to me, and this tour was like being in an episode of How It's Made, only in real life. I also got to see some of this touch to open servo drive hardware in person for the first time and immediately knew I wanted to use this hardware on these kitchen cabinets. So the folks at Bloom were awesome enough to help me plan out the specific hardware I'd need and we spent some time going through my SketchUp model to figure everything out. And they even went so far as to mock up the not so tiny house kitchen in their kind of hands-on design area. And it was really awesome to see the layout of the kitchen in real life after staring at the 3D model for the last year. Well, I also got some advice on installing some of this new to me hardware, which can definitely be a little tricky. And that was super helpful when it came time to install everything here in my shop, as you'll see in this video. So fast forward a few months and I was finally back in my shop building the cabinets and I decided to go ahead and knock out the hardware installation on the two base cabinets with doors first and the sink base was up first. So the CNC had already drilled the holes for mounting the hinge plates so I went ahead and got those installed and then I could mark where I needed to install the hinges themselves on the doors. To drill the holes for the hinge cups, I used this drilling tool made by Bloom. And the kind of special thing about this tool and what makes it different from the hinge jigs I've used in the past is it drills the eight millimeter holes needed for these Bloom Inserta hinges. And this was my first time using these hinges. I've seen my buddy Mike Farrington use them a bunch. And man, these things are awesome. It definitely won't be my last time using them. They're super easy to install and uninstall with this kind of clamping mechanism. And this definitely speeds up the cabinet assembly and disassembly process. Once the hinges were on, I snapped them onto the hinge plates. And after getting the door installed on the cabinet, I could make any minor adjustments to get the door lined up nicely. And I repeated the process for the other door and the doors were looking great. Before moving on though, I needed to go ahead and get these push to open latches added and these are Bloom tip-on latches. And I figured the easiest place to install this tip-on unit was on this top stretcher since it kind of needs to be installed similar to where a handle would be. After drilling the hole, I slid in the latch and could test it out and it worked great. I repeated the process for the other door and could call the install done. Next, I could work on the blind corner cabinet, and first I needed to add a panel to the front edge of the cabinet. And this cabinet will house one of these super cool Reva Shelf corner slide out units, which is of course back ordered till February, but the cabinet construction was pretty simple. So as you can see, the adjoining cabinet will butt into this panel, and this panel will give me something to attach the other cabinet to, along with the cabinet door hinges, and it will act as kind of a filler strip as well. To install the panel, I just stapled and screwed it in place, adding edge banding to the inside edge off camera. With the panel installed, I could get the door hinges installed, and because of this kind of weird orientation of this door, I had to get some specialized hinges, and I got the hinge plates installed inside the cabinet, about three inches from the top and bottom, and that was pretty standard. And then I could get the hinge itself installed on the door, which was again, the same process as before. Once the hinge was installed, I could attach the door to the cabinet. And as you can see, this hinge has to kind of wrap around the side of this panel to work. I got another tip-on unit installed on this cabinet, but this time I used the adapter plate option for mounting the latch since that seemed a little easier. To drill the holes for the mounting plate, I used this Bloom Universal Drilling Template, and I cannot believe it took me so long to finally pick one of these up, considering all of the Bloom products I use. Anyway, I got the adapter plate mounted to the cabinet using some 5mm screws, and then the tip-on unit could just snap onto the plate, and the door was good to go. With that done, I could move on to the rest of the base cabinets, which all featured drawers, and I went ahead and batched out the drawer boxes for the kitchen, cutting the parts at the table saw. 
I cut the groove for the drawer bottoms into the sides at the router table, and once that was done, I notched the backs of the drawer boxes for the bloom undermount slides at the bandsaw. And I have an entire video that goes more in depth into this process of building drawer boxes for bloom undermount slides, which can be a little tricky if you've never done it before. So I'm gonna kind of skim over some of those details in this video. I did add a little extra finishing touch to these drawer boxes by adding a bullnose profile to the top edge of the drawer box pieces. And this just gives the edges a nice rounded profile with no sharp edges and essentially eliminates the need to sand the edges. The last step before assembly was to drill pocket holes in the front and back pieces of the drawer boxes using the smaller Craig micro drill guide. Next, I could get the boxes put together, adding glue to the grooves for the drawer bottoms before clamping and screwing the pieces together. Since I used the same half inch material for the drawer bottoms, I could screw the locking devices for the undermount slides right to the bottom of the drawer boxes, and I used a self-centering drill bit to pre-drill these holes. Also, since I'm using the servo drive electronic touch to open system, I needed to add these depth adjustment add-ons and they'll allow me to set my drawer box depth perfectly to work with the servo drive system. The last thing to do on the drawer was drill these holes in the back of the drawer boxes for the hooks on the back of the undermount slides. With that done, I could slide the drawer into place in the cabinet and lock it into the slides. And to open the drawer, I could tap the front of the drawer to trigger the servo drive unit to push the drawer out electronically. Super cool. So now let's take a look at how this servo drive system is actually installed. So the servo drive units are mounted on this aluminum channel onto which a few lengths of 24 volt wire were pre-installed. To mount this aluminum channel inside the cabinet, Bloom supplies these mounting brackets, and I needed to drill some very specific holes to mount these brackets. So I whipped up a quick little drilling jig since I needed to install these brackets in multiple base units. The two holes towards the center are just for locating the bracket, but the outermost hole is a through hole for the power cable to run through. And after drilling the holes, I vacuumed up the dust and then dropped the bracket in place, driving in the screws which expand the plastic on the bracket to secure it in place. I repeated the process for the top bracket, which you'll just have to take my word for as you can't see anything I'm doing here, and then I could get the aluminum channel dealt with. So first I needed to cut the channel to length to fit into the cabinet, and since it's aluminum, it cut easily on my miter saw. After cutting the channel, I test fit it into the cabinet, and you can see how it locks into those mounting brackets. Next, I needed to get the 24 volt cables installed in the channel, so I pulled it back out of the cabinet and started fitting the cable into the grooves in the channel. Once the two cables were fitted into the channel, I could get the servo drive units installed, and I first marked out their locations on the channel. Once I marked out the locations, I pulled a servo drive unit out of the box and got it fitted on the channel, and it just snaps into place and clamps onto the cables. I repeated the process for the other two drive units and then finally cut the cable to length, leaving about two feet of excess cable to give me plenty of room to connect to the main power supply. Finally, I could feed the cable through the hole in the bottom of the cabinet and snap the channel into place in the cabinet. Next, I could get the drawer slides installed, and unfortunately, I hadn't programmed the CNC correctly, so I needed to manually drill the mounting holes. Thankfully, this was super easy, again, with that universal drilling template, and I could just clamp it into place, spacing it off the drawer dividers with a scrap piece of plywood, and drill the holes with a five millimeter drill bit. And then I could install the slides, which was super simple with the holes pre-drilled. And I once again used those five millimeter screws here, and the slides went in super quick. I repeated the process on the other side of the cabinet, and then I could get the drawers installed and get the servo drive units powered on. To connect the cable coming from the cabinet to the main power supply unit, Bloom provides these clamping connectors, which make it super simple to splice these cables together. And you can power a bunch of drive units off of one main power supply, which is why I left plenty of extra cable coming from the cabinet. After connecting the cable, I noticed the LEDs on the servo drive units weren't coming on, and it turned out this was because I had mixed up the cables on the aluminum channel. So there are two cables here, one for the different servo drive units to communicate with each other. The other cable supplies power to the servo drive units, and the orientation of these cables is <laughs> evidently important, which I figured out the hard way after the units weren't powering on. After swapping the cables and reinstalling everything in the cabinet, the LED lights were on, so I was good to reinstall my drawers and test everything out, and as expected, the drawers worked perfectly. 
And I don't think I'll ever get tired of how cool it is to just tap a drawer and have it pushed out. It just makes me so happy as a tech nerd and a woodworker. Anyway, next I could take everything back apart since I still needed to finish the cabinets obviously. And I could repeat the process on two more base cabinets including the island cabinet with these super wide drawers. And after installing all of these drawers, I was scratching my head wondering why the servo drive units weren't working. And as it turned out, I completely forgot to <laughs> install the units. And evidently this cabinet building process is turning my brain into mush. I got them installed and working and then I could go ahead and get the drawer fronts installed on the drawers. And to help me get the drawer front attached to the box temporarily, I used these little peel and stick dots from Rockler, and then I could partially slide out the drawer and clamp the front in place to hold it more securely. I attached the drawer front using these one inch screws with a large pan head, and you can drill the holes in the boxes oversized if you want a little more room for adjustment. With that, the first drawer front was installed, and I repeated the process for the rest of the drawer fronts using 8th inch HDPE plastic strips to space the drawer fronts apart. And once they were all installed, I could check the island cabinet off of my list, and next it was on to the wall oven cabinet. So instead of a range, I'm using a separate Samsung cooktop and wall oven in the tiny house. So I needed to build this base cabinet to fit the specs of the wall oven. And the oven needed a solid shelf to be installed on. So I figured out the location of this shelf and got it installed in the cabinet with more staples and screws. I also needed clearance above the wall oven for the cooktop. And I added another piece at the top of the cabinet to fill out that area. And this is where the cooktop will hang down into the cabinet through the countertop. After installing the shelf, I realized that I'd ended up with this little cubby that I hadn't accounted for. And after a little consideration, I decided I needed a drawer for this spot, as it would be perfect for storing baking sheets and that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, undermount slides were a no-go as they'd just take up too much space in the drawer opening. And I also realized this cubby was so small that I couldn't get an impact driver in, so I needed another solution there too. So I went ahead and built a drawer box, which was almost comically thin, but I think it'll still be really useful. And I used quarter inch plywood for the bottom panel just to save some height and just glued and brad nailed it in place. So I decided on using side mounted slides instead of undermount slides, and I figured I could mount them to some wooden rails, which I could slide in and attach from the outside of the cabinet. Next, I slid the assembly into the cabinet, set it back a sixteenth of an inch, and clamped it in place before adding some one inch screws through the side of the cabinet. And this actually worked great and was kind of the perfect solution for this too tight drawer opening. I slid the drawer into the opening, adding some eighth inch spacers below the drawer and then slid it out bit by bit to attach the slides to the side of the drawer. I removed the drawer to add the last screw on each side and then I could finally slide it back into the cabinet. So attaching the drawer front here was pretty tricky since the soft close mechanism on this hardware adds a lot of resistance and my standard painter's tape and CA glue trick was not working here. Instead I just slid the drawer out partially, lining things up using a square, and then clamped the drawer front in place and this ended up working out fine. So the last base cabinet to deal with was a cabinet for the trash can and recycling bin to be hidden in. So I started by installing the slides for the pull-out drawer which will house the bins and this was super simple considering they came with a paper template. I of course forgot to build the drawer for these waste bins during my previous drawer building session so I had to set everything up once again to make this drawer which was a total pain. After getting the drawer dry fit, I could test fit the bins and they were a little bit snug. And to remedy this, I decided to remove an angled section from the side of the drawer to give the recycling bin in the back a little bit more room to slide back in the drawer. So I taped the two drawer sides together, marked out my cut, and then headed to the bandsaw to make the cut. And the cut was pretty clean right off the bandsaw, but I still cleaned it up a little more by running the edges on my jointer, which got them perfectly straight and square. I cut the drawer back to fit off camera and then could do another test fit and the bins fit perfectly. I also got the center divider fitting nicely and this will just keep the cans from tipping. With the fit looking good, I got pocket holes drilled in the pieces and got the drawer assembled and installed in the cabinet. And I also realized I had enough room for another drawer above the trash cans, so I built another drawer for this area, added a divider, and got the drawer installed. I also added these little bumpers to the front edge of the cabinet, and these will help with the functionality of the servo drive units. I also needed to add some similar bumpers to the upper drawer and I actually 3D printed a drilling jig for this which actually ended up working out great. 
And with that done, all of the base cabinets were officially built. So then it was on to the upper cabinets. So I got all of the upper cabinets assembled in the last video. So you can go check that out if you want to see that process. And with them assembled, I could get to work on installing the super cool touch to open hardware from Bloom's Aventos line. So I started with these HK top hinges, which were super easy to install. And they come pre-installed with this little yellow alignment guide, which I just butted up to the front edge of the cabinet. And then I could drive in the four included screws. It was about <laughs> the simplest hardware install I've ever done. I could then remove the alignment guide and test out the hinge, sliding up the orange safety lever, which keeps it from smacking you in the face, to allow it to open. Next, I needed to drill some mounting holes for the remote units, which mount on either edge of these cabinets. And this hole is a little bit tricky to drill, as it actually goes beyond the front edge of the cabinet. And as you can see, the first jig I came up with <laughs> failed miserably, and the bit ran off course. Thankfully, the damaged area will be covered by the remote, so I came up with another jig which fully surrounded the Forstner bit this time, and this worked much better. So as you can see, the remote just snaps into the hole, and this is how you close the upper cabinets electronically, as you'll see in a bit. So speaking of the upper cabinet doors, next I needed to cut the doors, which I hadn't actually done yet. And this is real-time footage of the CNC cutting through the full depth of this 3 quarter inch sheet, and it is just nuts how fast this thing cuts. So after cutting, I got the doors edge banded with my little Rockler edge banding machine, which I talked about more in the last video in this series. And once the doors were edge banded, I could get them installed and Bloom makes this little jig for marking the hole locations on the doors. And the jig can be snapped into the hinge and then I could set the door in place, centering the door using the little adjustment wheel on the jig. And then I gave the door a couple of taps to mark the hole locations. With the hole locations marked, I could line up the universal drilling template with the holes to make sure I drilled the holes nice and square, and then I drilled them to depth with a 5mm bit. I could then install the mounting plate on the back of the door with some 5mm screws. The last thing to do before installing the door on the hinges was to add these little spring-loaded distance bumpers, and these space the door off of the front edge of the cabinet by about an eighth of an inch, and these are installed in another 5mm hole near the corners of the door. With that done, I could extend the hinges and then snap the adapter plates in place. And thankfully, everything seemed to line up nicely. And I could test out the door and it worked great. And I just made a few minor adjustments to the hinges to set the opening angle. Next, it was time for the real fun part, making this hinge work electronically. So Bloom makes this servo drive unit for these Aventos hinges, and they use the same power supply as the servo drive drawers I installed earlier in the video. With that done, I could connect the unit to the power supply with one of those cable connector clamps, and the unit was powered. Next, I needed to pair the drive unit with the remotes, which was as simple as just pressing a few buttons. After pairing, the unit asked to do a few test cycles, and you want to make sure your door is installed when doing this, as otherwise the safety mechanism on the hinge will cause the test to fail. So I got my door installed and it could run the test cycle and this was my first time seeing these things in action in my shop. And man, was it cool to see this thing moving on its own. And the test cycles went great so I could pair the second remote and then just kind of geek out over this ridiculously cool hardware. To open the door, you just tap on the front and then to close it, you just press either remote. How cool is that? So I repeated the process of installing these Aventos HK top hinges on the other two upper cabinets, but before installing the lower door on this cabinet, I needed to double up the fixed shelf in the middle of this cabinet as I needed a thicker shelf for these two doors to kind of break on. To do this, I added a inch and a half wide strip of maple to the front edge of another piece of three quarter inch plywood, gluing and pin nailing it in place. Once the glue had dried, I cleaned everything up and then added glue to the top of the existing shelf and then dropped the new piece in place, clamping it in a few spots just to make sure it bonded well. With that done, I could get the hinge installed in the bottom half of this cabinet, but the hinge here was a different model from the Aventos line, the HL, and this hinge lifts the cabinet door in a different way, which you'll see. So I accidentally forgot to start the camera here, but I got the hinges attached to the inside of the cabinet and got the arms installed. And then I needed to cut this stabilizer rod to length. The rod was aluminum, so it cut easily on the miter saw, and this rod connects the two hinges to each other and makes sure they operate at exactly the same time and speed so the doors lifted evenly. 
After getting the rod installed, I could get the hinge adapter plates installed on the door, and unfortunately my jig didn't work here, so I had to do some actual measuring to figure out my location. Can you believe it? So thankfully the universal drilling template still worked for the hole spacing. I used the template to actually drill the holes. Also, one other tip here would be to pick up a metric tape measure if you're going to be using a lot of this kind of hardware. And since all of these numbers and blooms manuals are in metric, it's just much easier to use a metric tape rather than trying to convert everything to imperial. You're going to end up with a lot of 64ths to deal with, and I don't know about you, but I am not that accurate of a woodworker. Anyway, I got the adapter plates installed, and then I could attach the door to the hinges, and amazingly, it fit perfectly. I did need to adjust the door angle, and I also needed to lower the lifting force since this door was much lighter weight, but overall this hinge worked great. And I didn't hook up the servo drive system on this hinge yet since I knew I'd just have to take it right back apart again for finishing, so you'll have to wait until I install the cabinets in the kitchen to see this hinge in all its glory. With that done, I wrapped up the rest of this upper cabinet, drilling the holes for the remotes, and then I could take everything back apart for finishing. So the very last upper cabinet to work on was this little 12 inch wide cabinet which will be to the left of the microwave and I just kept it super simple on this cabinet and installed a standard set of door hinges. I did add one of the tip on latches that I showed earlier in this video as again there will be no handles on any of these doors or drawers. Once that was done I could wrap up the last few odds and ends of the upper cabinets starting by gluing up a few adjustable shelves. And I made these shelves out of two layers of three quarter inch plywood as I was worried about them sagging otherwise. And this was probably a little overkill, but I had plenty of plywood scraps left over, so I figured why not. After the glue dried, I trimmed the edges flush of the table saw and then added a strip of maple to the front edge to act as edge banding. After the glue dried, I trimmed the ends flush with my Japanese pull saw and then flushed up the edges using a trim router, a spiral flush trim bit, and this little trim router attachment that allows me to run it on its side. And this works great for trimming up hardwood edge banding. And then I could get everything taken apart, all the drawer fronts and doors removed, all of the hardware removed, and get everything sanded to prep for finish. And this is not a very enjoyable part of this process, but it has to be done, and I just put on a good audiobook and got to sanding. All right, I think that's where I'm gonna wrap this one up. As you guys might be able to tell, I've been spending the last couple of days spraying paint on all of these cabinets. I'm gonna do a whole video on my process of spraying paint or other finishes on cabinets and furniture in my next video. So go ahead and get subscribed and ring the notification bell if you don't wanna miss that video. Also, as always, I'll have links to all the tools and materials I use down in the video description below. And last, I wanna say a big shout out to all of my supporters on Patreon and my YouTube members. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much for your support. And I guess until next week, thank you guys for watching and happy building.